Good afternoon. Um, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I really. <laughs> asking a cop to do a TED talk is really risky. And um, this could go sideways real quick. Um, I have to tell you all, I'm far more comfortable talking crime and crime figures. So to that end, for the year, crime in Atlanta <laughs> is down 3%. Oh no, it gets better. Violent crime is down 15%. We've slashed overtime since the start of the fiscal year by 62%. You can appreciate that. And this department, the Atlanta Police Department, has done it short 350 officers. Are you with me? Yes. We have a good department. I've been policing um, and in the city for around 25 years. I've, I've been in every neighborhood, and I've been in homes across the economic spectrum. Some of the neighborhoods in our city are significantly hampered by criminal activity. You may have no idea where they are, never been there, or you may have been and don't wish to go back. As law enforcement, we have an obligation to show up to these communities with compassion and open arms on a daily basis. When I first started in this city, it was during the height of the crack epidemic. I worked in a neighborhood that was almost exclusively black. And it was during that time that the government and society were trying to get their arms around how to, how to rein in crack and what it was doing. And so the approach that was taken was three strikes and you're out. You go to federal prison, hit a crack three times, off you go for life. Uh, the judicial sy system was very rigid in this regard, but so society drove that. Society, s the, the, what you would commonly hear is of the crack users, look at them, just look at them. They're violent, you know, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna kill people. They're, they need to go away, they. Well, who they were, were largely young African-American black male, young African-American males. And the reality of it is, crack users suffer from substance abuse. They're no different than the person who abuses alcohol. And really, the crimes that they committed were against family members to get money for the habit. What did we do? Well, we went in and we arrested volumes of young black men, and we tore the infrastructure of the black community down. And I believe that, unfortunately, we have to a degree done irreparable damage. And it also introduced the gateway to racial profiling, stop and frisk. Here we are today. We have yet another drug epidemic, heroin. And wow, isn't our approach markedly different? The federal government is no longer asking law enforcement to lock individuals up. We are instead instructed, they're, they're putting millions of dollars to provide rehabilitative services to users. Employers offer health insurance for addiction. Police are instructed, they're given equipment to save the lives literally resuscitate, resuscitate the heroin user who gets up and walks off without even a discussion about if they'll commit a crime. To be clear, I am relieved we are getting it correct. Individuals who suffer from substance abuse, who abuse narcotics, don't belong in our prisons. Prisons do not help people recover from addiction. I'm happy we're getting it right. But when you look at these two and you contrast them, they're identical. It's crime and drugs.
That's both of them are, crime and drugs. But what's the difference? The difference is that crack users were predominantly black and heroin users are predominantly white. I throw that out there because if this is not a part of your thought process, then whatever circle you're on, you need to start kicking it out and you need to start broadening it because this isn't up for discussion. This is the reality. This is the reality of the world we live in. And if you're gonna be a driver of change, you need to be acutely aware of what's around you. When I was a kid, my parents did a huge service to my siblings and myself, and that is they did not say racist things. They didn't tolerate racist commentary. It was not a part of my upbringing. I lived in an area where poor people lived in very close proximity to people who were extremely well off. I went to a public school, and in the public schools, I went to school with children whose families were reliant on food stamps, and I went to school with kids whose families were very well off. I saw behaviors that we stigmatize by race today. The behaviors, the teenage pregnancy, welfare, getting arrested. But what was my world? Everybody in my community was white. And as such, I didn't develop the thought process that these were color-driven behaviors. It, there were other drivers of the issue. After college, I made my way to Boston. What I was aware of when I got to Boston was that there was a lot of Irish people, and I wasn't Irish. <laughs> and so that was my big takeaway. And I thought of myself as pretty open-minded. I had grown up in a, one type of an area. I'd gone to school in St. Louis. I lived overseas in a couple of different countries. I thought I kind of had a clue, and I, you know, there you go. So I come down to Atlanta for a job interview, and I came down because I was cold in Boston, quite frankly. <laughs> so I come down for this job interview, and I'm on this corporate elevator, high rise, and I'm going up, and I can remember this like it was yesterday. On either side of me are African-American males, good-looking in three-piece suits. And it hit me at that moment that the only black individuals riding the elevator with me back in Boston in my corporate high-rise there were the cleaning people. And I knew then that my circle had a lot to be desired. And I knew then that I wanted to be in Atlanta, and I knew then that if I was going to ever drive change that in my heart of hearts felt needed to be driven, I had to become better educated. So my career starts, and after a few years, I find myself on a plain clothes team. Oh, and for the record, I did not get the job, and to be honest, I don't even know how I qualified for the interview. But the big picture is it paid off. So, um, so I, uh, I'm on the plain clothes. So I'm on this plain clothes team. And it's a bunch of really big, bulky guys. And there's two females. And I'm one of them. And the other one's named Jackie. And w the two females, Jackie and myself, we weren't allowed to ride together. We worked plain clothes in a violent zone, and honestly, it was, it was dangerous work, and it made complete sense that we didn't ride together, because neither one of us is particularly large in stature. So, but Jackie and I started gelling, because we both really loved to laugh, and we, we just, it just resonated. We resonated with one another, and we also both really liked to work, and not that the guys didn't like to work, but, <laughs> No offense, Carlos, wherever he is. Um, <clears throat> but the guys just had more drama and baggage, and Jackie and I, so <laughs> we come into work, and we like, we want to hit it, and we want to do eight to 12 hours and knock it out and put butt in jail. So Jackie and I started riding together. 
And our supervisor, I, to be honest, I don't think he knew how to deal with two strong-willed females, so he just let it go. <laughs> so Jackie and I start riding together, and an interesting thing happened. Our friendship, friendship grew, and besides this, the superficial stuff, where you, you, you might like to eat the same place or laugh at the same things, I started to care for Jackie. She was starting to become a friend. And as such, I started to see things through Jackie's eyes. Now Jackie is black and she's from Atlanta. And I realized that the conclusions that I drew off of incidents were not necessarily the same as Jackie because our journey wasn't the same. On paper it looked the same, but the treatment wasn't. The journey there was different and I had to ask her probing questions to understand how she was getting to her conclusion, to understand that her journey was different, her circle was different, maybe not by choice. But I also realized that Jackie and I held back from one another. We knew we were different. And I think often in life, we like the portrait that others paint of us far better than we like the real self-portrait. And I wasn't comfortable telling Jackie that I was gay. 20 years ago, the, the black community was very intolerant of gays. She was from a religious family. And I didn't want it to change how she saw me. But I can remember clearly that it was a night that we were in some crappy, unmarked car in a crappy side street, actually trying to catch a rapist. That's good, the good part we were doing. But, <laughs> and I just thought, I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted from expending energy trying to keep this relationship upright, but I'm not being honest. And so I tell her, you know what, I'm gay. And <laughs> I just, you know, I figure we're not getting the rapist. We may as well, you know, turn it into something. And Jackie, what I should have seen at that time, Jackie just, she had no issue with it. She said, she immediately started wanting to run my dating life and boss me around. <laughs> and she, she just, she, it's been nothing but a speed bump. It's been nothing, it was nothing to her family. And she is absolutely one of my closest friends today. This opportunity to meet Jackie and to experience personal growth for me, which helps me lead, was a result of the Atlanta Police Department. The department is 58% African American. What does this mean? This means that when we bring our recruits in for six months, they're sitting in a class with people who don't look like them, haven't come from their background. They have to get uncomfortable. You have to be uncomfortable if you're gonna grow. And so that's what we ask of them because we want them. I want them to be uncomfortable because I want their circle to expand because I don't just want to build a cop. I want people who go out and are leaders and that when they go on that call where the Starbucks employee is too stupid to realize that everybody goes to Starbucks and does nothing, <laughs> that the police come in the police come in and say this for what it is. This is bullshit, we're not locking people up and leave. We have to get them on that trajectory where they see the biases of others and they don't let that dictate how they police. It's what, to do that then, so what we also do is we take them to the Center for Civil and Human Rights and we have them go on a guided tour because we want them to talk about race. How many of you will talk candidly with people unlike yourselves about race? You have to, you have to. And it cannot just be the black people driving the conversation. It has to be the white people that give a damn. It's also critical that our, our officers understand the role of police in the civil rights movement. It's an ugly, ugly 
history of ours in law enforcement. But we have to understand it because otherwise we're not going to understand the reaction when we go to answer a call in the black community. We have them go to the Atlanta Food Bank because you have to be, you have to be standing there putting in a box because when you go in you think, oh, you know, people want excesses. You're putting in a box toothpaste, tampons, and potatoes so, this, so, this, so, so a person can get this box and function for a week. What does that do? It means that you have to get outside your circle so that when you are dealing in your world, whatever your world is, you know when you're seeing that person who is dirt poor, you can feel and you understand they know they're poor. They're not happy being poor. This is not what they want. This is relative because if you're in this room, you're already a step ahead. You saw, at some point, you want to drive change. You want to be a part of the solution. Atlanta provides, I've been all over this country, all different police departments, and I am telling you, there is no other city comparable to Atlanta. The potential here is huge, but we're at that tipping point that we either get this right or the divide becomes too, too great to ever cross. And when you're sitting here, all of you, what you have to be doing is you have to be looking at your circle. Look at your circle. You spend the bulk of your life at work. How many of you have been a party to a conversation or driven the conversation that said, I'd like to hire that black person, but there's no one out there qualified. Stop. You need to be looking at you. And the, what you should be saying is, how come we haven't done a better job creating an opportunity for a minority? That's what you need to do. And if you're here, you give a damn. And I need you to give a damn so that we can change, change the narrative in some of the communities of Atlanta. Thank you for allowing me to be here.